So I wanted to start out reminding you, you probably don't need reminding, that what we're talking about right now is how to build phylogenetic trees. So what sort of data do we use and how do we actually construct the tree itself from data that scientists have? And last time we started working with some parsimony trees and some distance trees, most of today is about practicing making distance trees. It seemed like that was less than clear last time. Another thing that I didn't do a perfectly adequate job of doing was summarizing the results of the changes that we made to these two trees and defining all of the vocabulary that I wanted to. So just for a quick review summary, on the left, we had a tree where the common ancestor I said we assume is a female. And on the right, if it's a hermaphrodite. So way back in time, any individual that had two X chromosomes on the left, we're going to assume was a female. And on the right, we're going to assume the starting position was they were a self-fertile hermaphrodite. What vocabulary term would we use to describe that trait or that character? Is that ancestral or derived? You better, you better say ancestral, right? It's back in the past. So these are examples of ancestral traits. So what is, it, what is a derived trait for the tree on the left? Right. So the derived trait then is whatever trait has appeared since the ancestor existed. So here, hermaphroditism would be the derived trait on the other tree. The opposite would be true. If you start with the assumption that the ancestor was a hermaphrodite, then femaleness would be the derived trait. And the other thing I want to make sure that's really clear from this, I think I said this confusingly when I summarized this last class. On this tree, we agreed that there were two positions where hermaphroditism evolved. Those were the branches leading specifically to the two species that are currently hermaphrodites. That's the most parsimonious explanation of how this trait evolved. That the ancestor was a female, and that there were two independent gains of self-fertility in the phylogeny. That's convergent evolution or also called parallel evolution, when two traits, the same trait evolves twice separately. So that's convergence. Two females have converged on the same trait. This other tree, we decided, the one on the right, I think we decided there were many more changes on the tree, transitions from female to hermaphrodite or hermaphrodite to female, to describe that tree. So this one was less likely or less parsimonious. Specifically, what I misspoke about last class was when we were all done with all of this, I said something to the effect of, if you can find me a version of the tree that involves two changes or less, that would be the most likely situation. The tree on the left is the one that has two changes or less. So we had already arrived at the most likely solution, unless somebody in here has found a way to explain all these data with a single change, which is not possible, I don't think. So if you did, please tell me. So can so tree on the right. So the ancestral trait is hermaphroditism. So femaleness is a derived trait. Where on this tree? So the question was, what's convergence? So let's work a little bit more on defining convergence. So on the tree on the right, is there a convergently evolved trait? That is, where would we put lines on the branches that show where femaleness evolved? We did this last class. So it would have to evolve somewhere on the branch leading to Japonica, for example. This is one way to draw this out. So a hermaphrodite transitioned to a female at that point on that tree. Where else? Most likely, 
something that's common to all three of the female species, so maybe a transition right there to femaleness. So what's the convergently evolved trait on this tree? We've got two separate gains of XX females, so that would be a convergent or a parallel evolution of a trait. So on the left side, because we're assuming that the starting point was femaleness, anytime you see a hermaphrodite evolve separately, that would be the parallel or convergent trait. On the right side, the argument's backwards. It's the opposite. You start with a hermaphrodite, then if you see multiple independent groups of species evolving the same trait, femaleness, then that would be the convergently evolved trait. It's like mammal hair and coconut hair. Except not, because we decided those weren't homologous traits. But yeah, so parallel evolution, evolution can take two totally different routes to arrive at the same sort of a trait. Like wings on bats, wings on birds. Is that clear up that? Okay. Other questions at this point? Who we're moving next is to practice building distance trees a little bit more. So looking at gene sequence alignments and then counting differences between the gene sequences building distance trees. So again, the brief reminder, this is how using DNA sequences, a phylogeneticist and evolutionary biologist builds a distance tree. You take two or more DNA sequences, you line them up, you simply count for every two DNA sequences that you're looking at, how many differences are there, and you look down in each column. So these, I hope you agree with me that these two DNA sequences look like they're similar. These are two sequences from the same gene. When you read them from left to right, all of the unshaded boxes, the two genes have the identical sequence. That's what suggests to evolutionary biologists and a geneticist that these are the same DNA sequence. Why are they different? Why are they different? So they are different sequences. Two different species. Why are the gene sequences different? Because two different species, so what happened? What? Yeah, mutation. So mutations have happened in two different species. They're closely related. The DNA sequences look similar. They're just, in this case, single nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs, mutations. So occasionally, you find one nucleotide that's different when you compare the two species. And that's why we're counting differences. So in this case, the distance between these two species would be two. So we count differences, distances. Okay, so given that, here's a new question. I know this is really small. There's a reason for that, but here are four DNA sequences. They're related to each other, supposedly. I'm telling you they're related to each other. Which two are the most closely related in sequence? So I heard one and two. So what's the distance between one and two? Yeah, there's one position, the second position here, C and T. Otherwise, the two sequences are identical. So the distance between those first two are, is one. OK, so one and three is also a distance of one. So two and three, when you compare them, also have a distance of one. So trick question, ha. Huh? There are three most closely related species on this tree according to the similarity of their gene, of the sequence. They're all three of these pairs, one and two, one and three, and two and three, all have distances of one. So what would that look like if you drew that, if you drew this on a phylogenetic tree? You've got three species that are equally distant from each other. So this is a polytomy. So you have, OK, so that was the bottom example down here. It was one of the trees we started working with last class. 
And remember, when we have these matrices, we don't have to fill out A and A, the distances are always zero, C and C, D and D, B and B are always zero. So we only have those three, nine, sorry, <laughs> six boxes left to fill out. And we just did A to B, you told me it was distance of one, A to C was a distance of one, B to C was a distance of one. So all three of those species look like a polytomy, A, B, and C. They're all one nucleotide sequence change different from each other. So what are the distances from all three of those, A, B, and C, to D? So you look down. Let's, do, let's make this simpler. What's the easy thing to do to this alignment of four DNA sequences that simplifies the analysis? There's more information up here than we need. Right. Any column that has all the same nucleotide is uninformative. It doesn't tell us anything about the relationships between the species because they're all the same. So just ignore those. Cross them out if you want. They don't tell us anything about the relationships with, uh, between the species when they're identical among all the species. So now it's a little bit maybe easier to see the distance from A to D, CT to AG. There's no similarity there. Two changes, so two differences. And the same is true for B to D, TT, AG, not identical in either position, and the G to T and A to G, they're different. So where are we going to put D in this tree to make it equally distant from A, B, and C? It's going to connect to this node, and then you put it wherever you want, over here in the corner if you want. So now D and A, D and B, and D and C are equally distant in terms of distance, branch lengths. So now the last question is, what are the branch lengths? If we relate them all to the, num the sequence distances we put in this matrix. So you want to say, I heard up here, all, so all four branches, there are four different branches there that share a node. So what are the lengths? Are they all one? No. Ooh. Yes. I like it. So here's what I'm hearing. One of the options is to make all the branches one. What's the problem? Right, so what's the distance from A to B supposed to be according to our matrix? One. It says in the matrix over here that the distance from A to B is one. There's one nucleotide change. But when you go from A to B, now we've got two. So how do we fix this tree in terms of the numbers we've written on the tree, the branch lengths? So I heard make it, make those branches 0.5. So now A to B, A to C, and B to C are all one. And then D to the node becomes 1.5. So now you've got two from A to D, B to D, C to D. Nicely done. So this is probably the trickiest type of tree I would ask you to draw. Normally, I try to make examples. That, this is all artificial, by the way. Real phylogeneticists using real gene sequences have to use computers to calculate branch lengths because they never work out to full numbers or even simple fractions. They're always really long decimals. So I try to make it easy just for computation during exams and these sorts of exercises. But it's, in reality, never this simple. Let's see. Any questions about that? And then we're going to move on to the top example. We drew the tree for the top example last time, but we didn't get the branch links on. So I want to do that as well as practice unless there are some questions first.
do one more example. All right, so let's see. We're going to have to reconstruct the six distances, unless somebody remembers them. A to B is 2. A to C is 3. A to D is 4. So in A and D, the only sequence they share in common is, the only position is column number 2. Ah, so I can make this easy on myself again. I can just ignore that column because all four of the sequences have T. So I don't need to pay attention to that. So then B to C, other than the first A, there are three differences. The 3, 4, and 5 are different. B to D, they're all different. No single position is the same in both of those sequences. And C to D is what? Three. So that final T is the same in sequence C and D, but all the other three characters are different. Did anybody get something different? Because I might have screwed up. Is that? Okay. So when you're faced with this sort of problem, how did we start last time? What's the first thing to do to start drawing a tree from these data? Sure. Yeah, so start with the smallest number on the tree. So two. So A and B are most closely related. So start, anyway, by drawing them as sister taxa. They share a common ancestor. Should we put the branch lengths on yet, or do you want to draw the full tree and then start putting branch lengths on? It doesn't really matter. Should we oh, do the tree first? Do it now? Well, it's two. So let's assume that each of the two, we'll start with this point. Distance from A to B is two, so we'll split them in half. We'll say one branch is one, the other branch is one. Okay. Now, what next? A, so add C. Okay, so where are we gonna add C? It's equally distant to A and B, So straight out to the right, just for now. OK, so what would the branch that I just drew, that would be 2 long. So the distant, total distance from A to C and B to C is 3. So we've got that done. We've got A to C. We've got B to C. I'm just scratching them out so that I can keep track of what's left to pay attention to. All right, now here comes the trickiest part. Did anybody figure this out, by the way? So this is, I think, about where we got last class. So what do you do? I just put a branch halfway um, on the tree that I had. So it became one and one, and I split it with the other branch. OK, so you divided this branch in half mm -hmm. to make that 2 into 1 plus 1. And then what did you do? And then I just um, put a D over there. You put a D At that last point. like this. OK. So does this meet all the that last column of requirements? The distance from A to D and B to D is 4? Mm -hmm. 1 plus 1 plus 2. Mm -hmm. You didn't know you were doing remedial math on a Friday morning, did you? <laughs> and C to D is 3. So we worked that, this out entirely empirically, and when I give you these sorts of questions on exams, I will factor in plenty of time for drawing alternate trees and trying to work this out. Because we're not using computational methods to make the trees, this is all, like I said, empirically done, usually. You sit down, you draw out different combinations until you find the arrangement and the numbers that work for the data that we have. Trial and error. Any questions about this? <coughs> yeah. 
I've got one new example to give you. It's going to be an exercise to complete for next class. So you'll have to try this on your own, and then we'll talk about the answers to that next class when we meet. All right. So some details about the term paper. You've hopefully all seen them online by now, and they were posted on Blackboard. I wrote this really long thing. I apologize. I wanted to get all the details in digital form so that we sort of had a contract, what I expect. You know sort of how I'm going to grade, what I'm looking for, details about length, font size, margin size, the boring stuff. Here's what I'm thinking in terms of timeline. So some of this is already on the syllabus. Some of this is new. So you knew that the topics are due by March 7th. That's on the syllabus. And you're posting them to Google Classroom. I haven't started except for maybe one or two of you that started asking me a month ago. I haven't really started responding, but I will very soon. So you post comments on Google Classroom, I'll respond. So yeah, I think that's a good idea. No, I think you should tweak that idea a little bit. We'll do a back and forth digitally on Google Classroom until you and I agree that you've got the top. That's what's due on March 7th. So this weekend, I'm going to spend a lot of time responding to your comments. An outline of the paper then is due about a week after that. And by outline, I just mean I'd like you to show me what sort of structure of arguments or information you want to present. So it doesn't have to be super detailed. But I want to see that you're starting to think. I'm just trying to push you, because I don't want you to leave this until the last minute. Because you know, senioritis is setting in, if it hasn't already. That's why I also would like to see a draft of the introduction. The introduction to the essay is going to be probably the longest part that involves the most adding references, citations, literature that you've read that you're using to support your argument. So I'd like to be able to see that so I can give you feedback on it before you finish the rest of the paper. So you've got about three weeks from when the introductions due. I'll give you feedback on what I think your introduction is like, whether or not it's meeting the requirements that I'm looking for, if the formatting of the citations is appropriate, et cetera. And then three weeks or so after that, the term paper is due. It's due then so I can grade it before the end of the semester so that you know what your grade is and you will know whether or not you're graduating if you're graduating this semester by the time the term ends. So I apologize for making it due earlier than it might have been, but I, hopefully that means you've got time to focus on other stuff after you get the term paper. So all those details of what I'm looking for are on Blackboard. Questions about the term paper at this point? Yes, please. Where do we start on trying to choose a topic? Okay, so trying to choose a topic, where do you start? The origin of species. No. It all starts from Darwin. So a lot of the exercises we've done in class so far where I've asked you to go out and get some information for me and post it on Google Classroom was trying to start at least getting you finding some details, scientific studies that might be interesting to you. So for example, the go find a paper that has a published phylogeny in it, that's one way to choose a topic. You found a paper, you know it's got an evolutionary topic in it because there's a phylogenetic tree in there. So if all else fails, ask yourself, is that the topic that motivates me to write a term paper? <laughs> Do you have a pet? Is there a lot of evolutionary research on that species? If so, maybe that's a topic that motivates you. What I really want is for it to be a topic that motivates you because that's what's going to make you excited, hopefully, or at least more excited than other topics, to write a paper for this class. So for example, a number of you have posted that find a paper that has a published phylogeny. A lot of them were on dogs. So it's typical for a lot of students in class to write about the evolution of dogs. It doesn't have to be a paper about one species or a group of species. It can be about a concept also. So choosing a species is an easy way to go. So we talked about bats a lot. OK, talk about the evolution of flight. We haven't talked about emus and other ratite birds. You could talk about the evolution of the loss of flight. Other examples we haven't gotten to yet, unfortunately, in class. That's the problem with assigning this so early in the semester. We haven't covered a lot of the topics. What about mimicry? So the parallel evolution of similar color patterns in different species, warning colorations. So trying to warn predators that you're poisonous. So how did that evolve multiple times? What do we know about that process? So it can be 
broadly, although not this is not exclusive, but it sort of topics can be broadly categorized into students choose a species or a group of species, or they choose a concept that we know a lot about the evolution in multiple species. So a concept being, for example, the evolution of warning coloration. You talk about that in numerous species, butterflies, reptiles, et cetera. Or you could focus on how did this one species evolve. The reason that I'm asking you to get your topic cleared by me is I just want to make sure that whatever topic you choose, there's enough published literature on it for you to write a successful term paper. I want to try to steer you away from things that you might be interested in, but when I look, I try to see, you know, is there anything published on this topic? I, if there's nothing there, I don't want you to start trying to write a paper on it. Because citing published literature on this topic is critical for this paper. I don't remember. Does anybody remember? <laughs> That's why I wrote it down, so I didn't have to remember. Five to eight pages, approximately. And really, I do mean what I wrote on Blackboard. This is one thing I do remember, because we always have this conversation in this class every year, semester, is I, there is no minimum length. So if you satisfy all of the requirements of the essay, that is the topics I'd like, I mentioned in that Blackboard post, if you can do it in less than five pages, that's fine, as long as you've met all the requirements. I prefer concise writing. Who doesn't? Less words for you to write, less words for me to read. And that's actually the mark of a really successful student, is the ability to summarize a lot of information that you've read about into something that's relatively short. That's a lot more appealing to everybody involved than writing something that's like 12 or 15 or 20 pages. So I don't care really about font size, margins, spacing, single space, double space. Just meet all the requirements. So with that in mind, I thought I had those notifications turned off. <laughs> I want to give you a little bit of feedback on a few of the submissions for the Find a Published Phylogeny exercise to give you an idea about what I'm looking for when I talk about published primary literature and citation format. So we'll go through this pretty quickly, I hope. I won't, won't try to draw this out very long. So, the citations you should try to find for this paper are papers that are published in scientific journals. So if you have questions about how you know whether or not something is a scientific journal, this is a good time to ask. And when I mean original research, I mean these authors on this manuscript are for the first time describing what they did, what their data were, and how they interpreted those data. So these are papers that have lots of graphs, charts, tables of data. They're published by scientific journals which, if you don't know by now, are magazines. They're just published by scientific societies that's not Discover, not Scientific American, but things post published by the Society for the Study of Evolution, the Genetic Society of America, the Society for Molecular Biology and Evolution. That's why it's hard sometimes for you to know what counts as a scientific journal, because you don't know what the societies are yet, probably, but I can help. The most important thing for whether or not these citations that you're going to use count is whether or not those journals, the papers are published in were peer reviewed, which you really don't know about unless you've been in science for some time. But does anybody know about peer review? What, so can somebody explain briefly? What's the idea? Someone basically writes a paper and sends them out to somebody else or somebody that like uh, details it, goes through it, see if the paper is uh, solid. So it goes to multiple uh, peers of that of that uh, sort of education, yep. and then if, it, if it's uh, done well, then it gets sent back, and then it gets stamped, and you can publish it. Yeah, essentially, right. So the idea of peer review is, I'm an author on a manuscript, so I've sent it to the journal, I've asked the journal to publish it. That's how I make my living as a scientist. I teach you, and then I write manuscripts so that I can convince the federal government to give me money to do research. So that's the currency of science, is how many publications you have, essentially. 
So when I send that paper into the journal, the journal editor sends it to three of my peers. That's the peer part of peer review. That is expert scientists that work in the same field as I do, so evolutionary geneticists usually. I don't know who they are, so this is all anonymous. So the journal editor knows who they asked to read my paper before they decide whether to publish it. Those anonymous reviewers send feedback to the journal editor saying, yeah, I think this is well-designed study that's got solid data analysis. The interpretations are valid. And then it, once everybody agrees that, yes, it's a solid piece of work, then the journal can decide whether or not they want to publish it. So this is the essence of quality science, is that has your study, has the experiment you did gone through any sort of peer review? It's the gold standard. If it isn't peer reviewed, it doesn't count. And so anytime you find a scientific society journal, I guarantee you it's gone, your paper, or the paper that's published in there has gone through that process. It's been vetted by expert scientists as a valid study. So that's what I'm looking for, peer reviewed papers published in scientific journals. What I don't want, you can use these, but don't rely entirely on review articles. So I'm going to show you some examples in just a minute. This is a little bit vague now, but it'll get more concrete in just a second. So a lot of scientific journals also have scientists who write review articles. That's summaries that are not aimed at the scientists per se, but are written for a broader audience. This is a great place for all of you to start learning about topics, is to find a review paper on whatever it is you're studying, because it's not crammed full of graphs and charts and data and tables and statistical analyses that we probably haven't ever talked about. And usually they're peer reviewed, because they're published by these articles, review articles are published by scientific journals. They just don't contain their own new published for the first time data. It's one scientist synthesizing, collecting a lot of data that other people have already published and trying to say, okay, here's the big picture. What does all of this mean? So I'll show you some examples of review articles and primary literature in just a second. So let's start here. Yes. So citations. I suggested in this assignment that we did that you look in the back of the manuscript, if you happen to have found a primary journal manuscript, look at how the citation or references cited section looked. So you don't have to use APA, MLA format. I'm not really picky about how you format the references for this term paper, as long as you're consistent. That's what I'm looking for. So are you using a format, and are you applying it consistently? So here's one of your submissions. Phylogeny of genus Spermophilus in position of, et cetera. Wait a second. Did I lose, did I lose it? I guess like two slides down. I'm two slides back, am I? Let's try again. Okay, so here, finally, one of your submissions. So is this from a scientific journal? This is, by the way, up here is a screenshot of the front page of the PDF. So what I look for when I want to know is it published is I look for the journal name. So up here it's molecular biology. So that in italics, right, because we italicize names of books, journals, newspapers, etc. So that's the journal that this paper is published in, Molecular Biology. Year 2015, volume 45, issue number three. That's all the information you need to write the citation up there in the upper left. <clears throat> and in this case, this student, this down here in the bottom is their post to Google Classroom on the citation. That looks like a valid format. Got last the authors, the year, the title of the paper, the name of the journal, the volume number, the issue number, and the page range. Okay? So that's a totally valid format to use. You don't have to use that format, but that works. So this is a peer-reviewed primary literature article from a scientific journal. That is one way to format a reference for this paper that's being cited. So. 
Questions about this yet? This is an example of the good. So here's another submission. This is just missing one thing. This is an example of the pretty good. From pheromones to behavior. How does this title sound different from the title on the previous page? Not very specific, it's sort of general, which makes you think that maybe it's a review paper. So this one was published in a journal called Physiol Rev, which you could probably Google and find out it probably stands for something like Physiology Reviews, maybe. So this is a journal who all they publish is review articles. So when you're looking for, again, when you're looking for a paper or paper, papers to start writing your manuscript, your term paper, Try to find review papers first. This is a great way to start learning about a topic. So Google whatever your topic is, and then just add a search term that's review. So Google dog evolution review, or parallel evolution review, convergent evolution review. You'll get these papers. You can cite these papers, but I don't want you to, re you to rely entirely on using these sorts of papers, because they don't contain data. They just contain somebody's interpretation of other data. So these aren't original primary research. These are reviews. Citation to me looks good. It's got the author's title, the name of the journal, the volume of the journal, 89, the page range, and the year. That's about all the information you ever really need in a citation. Sometimes the title doesn't show up. Sometimes it's just the names of the authors, the name of the journal, the volume number, the page range in the year. And I'm really trying your patience here because I really want you to get good grades on the term paper. And this is where a lot of students historically have lost points is simply how the citations are formatted. So yes, this was a PDF. No, this was not from a published scientific journal article. This was from a handout from a course at Cornell. This handout cited, did have some citations in it. So right there, Golan and Cranston, in the Insects, third edition, so a textbook. That would be fine to cite. So you, but you have to actually go find the textbook, read it, and cite it. Please, please, please don't cite something you haven't actually looked at. It's dangerous. I think this is the last example. This is a really good example. Hey, canine genome. Good paper if you're interested in doing the evolution of dogs to start with. Okay, phylogenetic tree, check. Specific title or generic title? More on the generic side, it turns out this is a perspective, which is kind of like a review article, it's just shorter. So if you see anything that says perspective, review, first glance, something that makes it seem like this is an overview or a summary of a paper, that's again kind of like a review article. So you can cite it, just don't rely on these entirely. The reason that I wanted to use this as, again, the last example was that this was the student submitted version of the citation circled there. Then I looked at the back of this paper, this paper that was published, by the way, here's the name of the journal, Genome Research. So this is presumably where all this information that went into this citation came from. It was the bottom of the first page of the article in the PDF. Genome research, there's a volume number 15, page range, year. But when I looked in, this is the citation format in this journal. So I looked at the back of Ostrander and Wayne's paper, the literature cited section, and that's what citations look like. Last name, comma, first initial, second initial, and last name, 
year, period, title of the paper. So those formats don't match. Right. On the left, it's fine format. It's useful. But what I'd asked specifically in this assignment was to use the format that's used in the paper that you're posting. So if you want to make sure that you're doing the formatting correctly, just copy what's in any one of, pick one of the papers that you cite in your term paper. Any one. It doesn't matter which one. Use that style. Apply it consistently. That'll be fine. The real bone I have to pick with this is that for scientific journals, the name of the press doesn't matter. What you really want instead of that is the journal name. So if that had said Genome Research instead of Cold Spring Harbor Press, that would have been much better. So this is down here in the very bottom. That's the format I would have used for this paper. Matches the citation format that's used by that journal. All right, blah, 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 blah. Your turn to ask questions. If you have any concerns, clarifications. So we can post a specific classroom assignment that says topics to be post, you know, for the term paper topics? Let's see. Will I post a classroom exercise for term paper topics? I did. So there's one now called term paper topics. So that's what I'd like you to post comments on, private comments. We can have conversations. So it's on Google Classroom now. All right. So last couple of points, then there's a couple minutes for you to do a little bit of group work. The midterm is coming up. And what I'd like you to do, because everyone always asks me how do I study for the midterm, is to ask you to help me, and those of you that have taken genetics with me already know what's coming. I'm going to ask you to help me create a study guide, because I don't write a study guide by myself. That's the exam. And now all the class work and all the exercises that we've done so far, that's what the exam questions will look like. Here's an alignment of gene sequences. Build me a distance tree with the branch links on. So what I'd like you to do, this is optional, is to send me, there's no credit, it's up to you to do this if you want to. Send me a question and an answer, a question you think I would put on the exam and the correct answer, what you think is the correct answer. Send it to me, I'll make a Google Classroom assignment for this. Those will be due on the 24th. I will immediately compile the practice question that you've written for us into a document that will be essentially a fake exam. I'll give that to you as a study guide. So you go through it, try to answer the questions, helps you understand which topics maybe you need more studying or work on, and then I'll also, also post the key to the study guide. And all of that happens before March 2nd, the class before the exam, so that when we have the day before, the two days before the exam, you come to class, you've done the study guide, then you ask me questions. So we have the full 50 minutes for you to ask clarifying questions about concepts you didn't understand from the mock exam. And as the assignment says, and it's true, your main carrot, your main motivation to do this is that one of the questions that one of you writes will show up on the exam. So your motivation is if you write the question, you're probably in a pretty good situation because you should know the answer to the question you wrote. Hopefully. So the last thing now, a few other things to do over the weekend. There's a big reading assignment that's on the syllabus. It's got a lot of chapters or sections or something. Skim it. That's the bottom part. This should be review. We're going to talk about transmission genetics next. So it'll be a brief review with some depth that we did go into in earlier classes. It should mostly be familiar. I'm going to post this exercise of a new sequence alignment to build a distance tree from. That'll be due on Sunday night. It's fast. It's just one example. It's three or four sequence alignments, build me a distance tree, turn that back into Google Classroom. Then now, I'd like you to start working on the next round of lyrics for our term-long project on evolution rap. So you can use the same groups that you used last time, have one 
member of your group, create a Google Doc, share it with all the group members, share it with me. I'm going to start that Google Classroom assignment right now and pick some topic related to phylogenetics. So a verse summarizing some important concept from phylogenetics. Uh, don't use analogies that totally bogus. Oh, shoot, I shouldn't use bogus. What rhymes with bogus? Anyway, you get the idea. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to post all three of these assignments right now. One's optional, review questions for the exam. One's for Sunday night, a distance tree. And one, the assignment we use to collect the lyrics. So spend the last couple of minutes, form your groups, create the document, and then have fabulous weekends. I'll see you next week. Yeah. Which one? The first. Uh, let me check. Do Monday. Do Monday? Yeah. Monday, 11.59 p.m.